The numbers, please. And here they are, our consumer price index for the month of April. Headline expected up two tenths is up three tenths, up three tenths. And do remember, this is a big drop from up 1.2 last month, which was the highest since 2005. If you strip out the all-important food and energy, expected up four tenths, a bit more, up six tenths, up six tenths. The high water mark here is up nine tenths, and that was in April of last year, and that went back to nine. 1981. And the money ball, year over year headline up 8.3%. <laughs>11th of May. And this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but where do we start? The inflation crisis is spiraling out of control. And despite the cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics' best efforts, they cannot put a lipstick on a pig. And inflation is showing alarming signs. While the headline reading went down from 8.5% to 8.3%, the devil is always, always in the details. On top of that, your beloved C9 leaders from the federal government and the federal reserve remain out of sight out of mind and their priorities are completely different from the american people and the inflation crisis that they're suffering from we're going to talk about that and a lot more i don't know about you but i'm fired up and ready to go so here it is in focus tonight Inflation nation. The inflation crisis is spiraling out of control. And unfortunately, your deal leaders, they're nowhere to be found. And even if they're found, they have different agenda completely. Their interest and their heart is not in this country, but in the interest of this country. Let's start by this. Stocks were bouncing up and down in a choppy trade because the stock market was attempting to read the inflation data, the CPI, also known as the CPI, due to its tendency of downplaying the true nature of inflation. And the market went up and down, up and down, within a range. But here's the problem. By the end of the day, all indices went down and closed negatively big time. The Nasdaq, for example, lost over three percentage points today alone, on top of the mounting losses it has been suffering from for weeks now. So what didn't the market like? Because the headline reading went from 8.5% last month to 8.3% this month. And of course, you and I know all of these readings mean nothing at all. The real numbers of inflation in this country exceed 20%. Just look at rents and what's going on in the rental market. But the headline reads, U.S. inflation slowed last month for the first time since August. And of course, the equities market likes this part, that perhaps inflation is peaking according to the cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And yes, on face value, inflation is at 8.3% and strip away food and energy and oxygen and everything important and you get a reading of around 6.2%. Here's the problem. When we look at the CPI components that are reading over 6% growth year over year, we are now at the highest read in history. We've never seen this kind of inflation, this broad range inflation, even in the 1970s. And hence, the stock market has a lot to think about besides the headline reading. Inflation reading month over month exceeded the experts' estimates and expectations by a wide margin, both for the price index and the core price index. And here it is. Look at this. When we look at the components of the CPI, the inflation in services went significantly higher. So did the inflation in food. Yet the inflation in goods went down slightly, and then energy inflation went down month over month by a decent margin. But 
Before you start to celebrate, look at what happened today in crude oil futures, for example, gasoline futures, natural gas futures, all exploding higher. So whatever dip we got month over month in the inflation in energy, that will be made up for and then some in the next reading. Because look at this, crude oil production in the United States went down for the first time since January of this year. And of course, the Biden administration continues to go on with the begging tour. They begged Iran. That's a no-go. They begged Iran. Back. That's a no-go. They begged Saudi. Saudi told them to get lost. So did the UAE. And then they begged Venezuela. That's a no-go. And now we're learning that they begged Brazil to produce more oil. And the Brazilians told the Biden administration to get lost too. The average gasoline price is at all-time highs in this country. You're paying more for gasoline. You're paying more for diesel. And by the way, the inflation in diesel prices will be reflected across all goods that we consume. As truckers and railroads have to pay more for diesel. So the stock market looks around and says, okay, the headline reading went down by two points due to the reduction in energy inflation month over month because we got a spike in February, March due to the invasion in Ukraine. But now that spike cooled down. Here's the problem. Energy prices are gaining ground. The fundamentals are getting worse. The supply is nowhere to be found. The Fed remains way behind the curve in crushing demand, the excess demand in this economy. And on top of that, we're seeing massive shortages, be it in jet fuel, distillate inventories, and even diesel inventories. And this will certainly push energy inflation month over month higher again in the next reading. So there is no such thing as peak inflation. In areas where we see peak inflation, it's not a good sign. For example, we look at the prices for online shopping. Well, they're cooling down. They've already peaked. Now you might say, oh, this is good news, Maverick, right? Inflation is peaking. Here's the problem. Look at what happened to stocks, online shopping stocks like Shopify, Etsy, Wayfair, Amazon. They're getting crushed. We're talking about losses of over 70% from the top. These stocks predicted that online shopping is peaking before we got this data because the stocks of these companies peaked last year in around October and November. So the stocks of these companies were saying, watch out here, the consumer's activities in online shopping will get crushed like you've never seen before. And it's not because supply is ample now or the demand cooled down. It is because inflation is surging out of control and the consumer has to chase inflation. So they cannot afford to spend more or in online shopping, or entertainment, or dining out, or soon enough, even traveling. You're going to see a lot of folks canceling their summer plans. Why? Because prices at the pump moving higher by the day, prices of utilities moving higher by the day, rents are surging out of control, in certain cases more than doubling. And we also have the prices of food at the grocery store surging out of control. And the consumer has to spend more in these areas in the economy due to inflation and cut back on these stimulative areas in the economy, such as online shopping, dining out, traveling, etc., etc., meaning that this is an economy in stagflation, and soon enough, this economy will be in a recession. Look at the baseline for inflation. I mean, it's not even close. We're already on the wrong foot. We're starting on the wrong foot. Massive gap between inflation in 2021 and 2022. You think that's going to slow down anytime soon? Of course not. When you have incompetent federal government, an incompetent federal reserve that continues to be way behind the curve, so careless about inflation, and their priorities are obviously entangled in globalist agenda, wars, and wokeness. That's what it really is. But doing their core job in tackling inflation, in maintaining price stability, forget about that. The American dream is dead now, but the Fed doesn't even care because their priorities are not your priorities. Now, when we talk about the headline reading for inflation moving down slightly, the devil is always in the details. And here's the devil. The index for meat, poultry, fish, and eggs increased 14.3%, the largest 12-month increase since the period ending May 1979. Unbelievable. And of course, eggs prices are not just rising due to regular inflation, monetary inflation. They're also moving higher due to the avian flu, which killed at least 10% of the nation's hens. Look at the prices of eggs. Unbelievable. Massive surge. One of the core components of breakfast in America. The prices out of control. The prices of bacon out of control. The prices of 
orange juice out of control the prices of coffee out of control meanwhile your wages are not keeping up with this inflation net net you're losing by the day you're working for free is this america what's going on here and the flu pandemic did not just kill egg laying birds but also thousands of turkeys ducks and other birds so we're gonna have a massive shortage of meat in this country and now economist Mohammed alarian is saying that the u.s is nearing a cost of living crisis we're already here and it's getting absolutely alarming take a look for a cold hard lesson on inflation step into the refrigerator where Karina Godino Wallink stores the food supplies she just bought for her pop-up food stand business in Phoenix Arizona so usually it would be the boneless would be about a dollar a pound um, right now it's 184 a pound this cheese used to be nine dollars right now it's on it's like 14.56 Two years ago, Karina opened up Down to Get Tacos, catering special events. Inflation has upended her business. Have there been events where you've just lost money? Oh, 100%. So these are from today. As we look over some of the week's receipts, Karina explains the hardest impact of inflation on a small business owner is how unpredictable her world has become. The demand for her business is there. Everything else is a nightmare. And that makes it hard for someone like you to run your business. Correct. It makes it unbelievably difficult for us to predict any pricing. I can't even say I'm going to charge you a certain price right now because in three days, it's probably bound to change, right. you know, and it's never for the better. Phoenix, Arizona has one of the highest inflation rates in the country. The latest statistics show it's three percentage points higher than the national average for cities. And that makes life harder for people living on fixed incomes, like Geraldine Spencer. This was the first one I ever did. As she shows us her painting skills, Geraldine tells us she lives on $1,700 a month in Social Security. She says she pays $600 in rent and at least $300 a month pays for needed kidney and blood pressure medications. The rest of her bills, like home utilities, car fuel and groceries, she finds depressing. How hard is it living on a fixed income? It is hard. And I feel so sorry for my friends that just don't have this kind of money as much as I do because they're much worse off than me. So my commute is about a block and a half, which is real nice. So you can walk to work? I walk to work. You're it's the best. That's a cheap gas bill. Oh, I love it. The walk home from the ceramic shop where Katya Schwartz works might save her money on gas. This is my humble abode. But the nights after work are filled with dread, searching for a new place to live. In four months, Katya's rent for this 300 square foot apartment is going to jump from $670 a month to just over $1,000. She says her paycheck won't cover it. I would consider living in my car, yes, I would. Though my sister would never allow it. Phoenix home prices have skyrocketed in the last year. Apartments Katia can afford are so far away that paying to gas up her car would then be too much. I would imagine that battling this at this stage in your life is... It's really hard. It's really hard. It's... It makes me feel useless. Like, I'm not doing enough. Are you worried that Katya says she's at stage one panic levels and the thought of what happens next makes her quiver. Ed Lavendera, CNN, Phoenix, Arizona. And of course, as Americans suffer from the cost of living crisis and shortages all over the place, most notably right now, baby formula. You cannot find baby formula at all. But Joey B doesn't even care. His priorities, his heart, is somewhere else. It's not with us, that's for sure. And his genius idea right now to tackle inflation after the beg for oil tour did not work out is to bow down to China and cut tariffs on their products. Wow, we are in a full-blown crisis right now. Bad decisions after bad decisions after bad decisions with no stop inside at all to the point where the Wall Street Journal is now saying President Costanza takes on inflation. What does that mean? Remember George Costanza when, hey, do the opposite? of what you're thinking is right because you have the tendency of f***ing up. So just do the opposite and you'll be fine. I mean, it's comical at this point. Everything that Joe Biden does is the wrong decision. Just do the opposite and we'll be fine. But rest assured, here comes your beloved senile leaders 
to the rescue. House approves $40 billion in inflation aid, beefing up Biden requests. Yay. Thank you. The relief is here. We don't have to worry about rent, utilities. Get oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wrong headline. Here it is. House approves $40 billion in Ukraine aid. Yep. Is Ukraine part of the United States? Not last time I checked. So why are we spending $40 billion on top of the $14 billion we've already spent while we have Americans suffering here at home? We have veterans, homeless, sleeping on the streets, under bridges here in California. But let's spend $40 billion in the proxy war that these senile leaders are launching against Russia, because that's what it really is. Take a listen. I think we all agree the most important thing going on in the world right now is the war in Ukraine. Now this senile turtle says, most of our trend going on right now is Ukraine. No, the most important thing going on right now is inflation in this country, bitch. Who the hell votes for this guy? What is his priorities? Obviously not the United States. Obviously not the American people. His priority is Ukraine, the proxy war in Ukraine. Continuing. I had a chance to call the president last week and request that the Ukraine package move by itself and quickly. Uh, he uh, said, let me think it over. He called back in about 15 minutes and agreed that we need to do this uh, Ukraine only and quickly. Because a coward is leading the fight and brutalizing his own people, turning them into animals in the way they are treating other people. So again, we think the size of the package is significant because it will enable the Ukrainians to more efficiently and quickly to... Um, to, um, to, 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 to prop up my Lockheed Martin calls. They're about to expire. I gotta make some money here. So let's pass this aid and all of these weapons to Ukraine now. Look at the urgency that they have in helping Ukraine, not this country. They gotta think and debate and take vacations. And oh, maybe we cannot afford it when it comes to helping this country with crumbling infrastructure all over the place, with sky high inflation, with an eviction crisis coast to coast, with the American dream dead and being reduced to owning a van right now. But it doesn't matter. They don't care about you. They care about Ukraine to deal with the challenge that they, that they face. It's going to allow pensions and social support to be paid to the Ukrainian people so they have something, something in their pocket. Yeah, let's send Ukraine $40 billion so the Ukrainians can have something in their pockets. Not the American people who are struggling to pay the bills, who are on the verge of bankruptcy, who are on the verge of losing their jobs now. No, 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 no. It's all about Ukraine. Shut up, keep your mouth shut, and go with the propaganda and the main narrative line that we're selling to you. And I hope Congress, I hope Congress will move on this funding quickly. I believe they will. But if Putin loses, then I think that's a great day for Europe, a great day for the United States. We need to triple down on our uh, willingness to help the Ukraine. We need to pass a $33 billion supplemental package, $20 billion for weapons. We need to work with the International Criminal Court to gather evidence to prosecute Putin personally. We need a, a resolution that I have with Senator Blumenthal, a Democrat, to designate uh, Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, we need to pour on, uh, put more weapons in theater that can uh, strike the Russian military offensively. So I want to triple down on beating Putin. So here it is again, another senile leader, Lindsey, Lindsey Graham. Well, apparently when he's not on Grinder, he's not working for you. He's working on tripling down on beating Putin. Is this how you beat Putin, Mr. Graham? Here it is. Whoops, the U.S. sent so many missiles to Ukraine that it depleted its own stockpiles. Wow, wow. I guess Ukraine is more important than this country right? And how's sticking it to Putin working out, by the way? Because the Russian ruble recovered all the losses since the war started and the stupid sanctions started and now trading at multi-year highs. On top of that, while inflation is raging in this country, inflation actually cooled down in Russia. So their currency is recovering, their inflation is going down, and oh, by the way, they're gaining territory in Ukraine and they're blowing up our missiles and our weapons that we're sending over there billions of dollars of your taxpayer money blown up in smokes. And now the U.S. spy chief warning that Putin is preparing for a prolonged war in Ukraine and it is likely to become more unpredictable and escalatory. What are we doing here, folks? Better question is, what are our senile leaders doing right now? Do they even comprehend the risk that they're getting us, all of us, into right now? The risk of a nuclear war? The risk of these stupid sanctions causing fertilizer prices to move significantly higher and the shortages all over the place to the point where we're now 
on the brink of a starvation crisis, a global starvation crisis, because wheat is not moving out, corn is not moving out, meat's not moving out, but most importantly, fertilizers not moving out of Russia or Ukraine. This is a massive problem, and our incompetent leaders who are fixated on Stukrutapun, the proxy war, they've already spent over $50 billion on that war. If this is going to be a prolonged war, how much more are we going to spend? $100 billion? 200 billion? And how would that rhyme with the American public when we have a cost of living crisis? Perhaps a recession, a very strong recession, a very destructive recession, and layoffs all over the place. And when it comes to the Fed, the Federal Reserve, it gets even worse because you wonder why the Fed is screwing up all over the place, causing market disruptions, massive losses in the stock market, and landing us not in a soft landing, but in a massive crash where the economy is going to crash big. And this recession will be unlike anything you've seen before. For the biggest and the deepest and most destructive recession we've ever seen. The tsunami of layoffs is coming. Why? Because the Fed remains incompetent. Jerome Powell is an incompetent fool who should have never been appointed as Fed chair. The man is not even qualified to be a dog catcher, but this is the Fed's priority, hiring the first black woman as governor. Meanwhile, they're screwing millions of black women who cannot afford rent, who cannot afford housing, who cannot afford groceries, gas at the pump, paying their utility bills. All what they want is the woke token. They say, look at us, we're diverse. Uh, we're not guilty anymore, but we're going to continue to screw you the same way and even worse. And now that the Fed is way behind the curve and Jerome Powell made a massive mistake of taking the 75 basis points out of the toolbox, which by the way, he's going to use not just the 75, but a full point in the next meeting, he will be forced to do it. Now the likelihood is we're going to see larger Fed rate hikes. And folks, this is what I've been warning about for over a year now in this program. The longer they wait, the longer they're behind the curve, the more destructive the approach in tackling inflation has to be, the more forceful the tightening of the monetary policy has to be. If Jerome Powell realized the problem last year and started increasing interest rates by 25 basis points last year and stopped purchasing MBS and bonds, we would have never gotten here with or without the Ukraine war. But the man refused to even use a formula to guide his inflation target. What could go wrong, right? And now that he's way behind the curve, he's going to realize that inflation is getting worse and it's not going to go down in its own. There is no such thing as transitory inflation. And what he's going to do instead of using 50 basis points the next meeting or even the 75 that he took off the table, he's going to be forced to use a full point. And then in the next meeting, another full point. And by slamming their foot, the Fed that is, by slamming their foot on the brakes, moving from the accelerator all the way to the brakes, this will produce massive destruction in this economy. And we're already seeing what that looks like. Here's a former New York Fed President Dudley. Listen to what he says. How disconnected are we right now from where we need to go? I think the problem is that the Federal Reserve has not been forceful enough in stating not just what their goal is, 2% inflation, but the means to achieve that goal. The Chair Powell in his press conference last week didn't really want to talk about why monetary policy might actually not just have to go to neutral, it might have to go to tight. And I think a tight monetary policy is what's going to be required to get inflation under control. Why are they timid? It's not, it's not clear to me. Uh... Well, it is clear to me, Mr. Dudley, because the Fed, Jerome Powell, remains so obsessed with the stock market. He's so afraid that he's going to say the wrong thing and freak out the stock market. Well, guess what? His strategy is already firing back because the stock market is dropping like a rock every single day with no stop in sight until the market realizes that we have a competent Fed. We're not even close to that. They're not timid. Certainly, they're not timid about talking about what the end goal is. But to me, if you're if you're talking about the end goal, 2% inflation, you got to also describe how you're actually going to get there. And if, if you start to uh, sugarcoat it, uh, then financial conditions don't tighten as much. And you also run the risk that people will lose confidence in the Federal Reserve. And here it is. Financial conditions are actually tightening. The problem is when the Fed acts wishy-washy, weaseling around and peddling back on their commitments to tackle inflation, financial conditions get loose once again. But you gotta remember, there is the financial conditions expectations according to stocks and bonds, then there is the reality of financial conditions. Now, financial conditions in real life are not gonna tighten to the point where it cools down demand in the economy, as the Fed is supposed to do right now because they have no control over supply right now but they have control over demand. And we know that demand is out of whack. There is no supply chain in the universe that can cope with this insane demand that was induced by the Fed's cocaine operation of launching 
the biggest tsunami of liquidity in human history back in 2020. But again, in reality, financial conditions are not going to tighten without the Fed walking the walk. What does that mean? Without them increasing interest rates aggressively, the Fed funds rate has to go higher. But we're already seeing the evidence of financial conditions tightening in the stock in bond markets. For example, you have stocks like Carvana that crashed big time. The mania is over. The bubble is over. The stock is down over what? 80% from the top now? Bear in mind that the executives already cashed out at the top in this rigged game that we call the stock market and the economy. But regardless, when financial conditions tighten and these stocks crash by 80% from the top, you're going to see the ramifications in real life. And here it is. Carvana is already laying off 20 500 employees via zoom of course and this will be replicated across the economy prepare for the tsunami of layoffs because when the fed uses the brunt force tools in crushing the demand in the economy to kill this inflation monster there will be casualties and the casualties will be not the rich not the oligarchs not the politicians but you and i baby regular folks we're gonna lose our jobs so the question is are you prepared to lose your job or do you have an insane credit card debt and a mortgage you cannot really afford rent, you cannot really afford car payment, you cannot really afford. This is the time to start asking these questions because you will lose your job. I promise you. And it's going to be humiliating. They're going to do it via Zoom. Hey folks, we're sorry we have to cut some spending here. So uh, you lost your job. Good luck. Bye. No regard that these employees have kids and have payments and have obligations. No regard at all. And you might say, oh, but the government is going to give me unemployment benefits and uh, eviction protection, yada, yada, yada. Not going to happen this time around. They cannot afford it. They can afford to send $40 billion to Ukraine, but not to bail your ass out. Oh, the billions are going to be available to bail Wall Street out, but not you. So are you taking things in your own hands right now by paying down your credit card debt, by getting out of financial obligations that you cannot really afford, by saving for at least nine months worth of expenses or not? This is the time to get prepared. Here's the last thought that I have from Sven Henrik. He says, if only they had started sooner. And what is this chart? This is the Fed effective rate in blue, which was zero for a long period of time. And then the consumer price index for energy. It went down the moment the Fed started increasing interest rates. Now, I've been telling you in this program and specifically in a video that I produced before, the real reason behind inflation that they don't want you to know about, it is not a supply problem. Why did prices at the pump in Saudi Arabia, for example, surge significantly higher to the point where the government had to cap the increases? Last time I checked, Saudi Arabia has an abundant supply of oil. Why are oil prices surging in Mexico? Last time I checked, Mexico has an abundant supply of oil. Why is the price at the pump rising in this country? Country when we have an abundant supply of oil. And yes, production went down this month, but it has been at historic highs, believe it or not, because inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. Dr. Friedman taught us this decades ago. Inflation is not a supply problem. Inflation is born when we have insane money supply by central banks, because that money supply produces excess demand. But whether you got the supply or not, there is no supply chain in the world that can cope with this level of demand. Now you sprinkle on a war in Ukraine and shutdowns due to the thing, the great panic of the virus, and now you have supply going down and demand surging out of whack, and people are wondering why we have inflation. This is the worst inflation dynamic that we've ever seen. But look at the magic. The moment the Fed starts tightening the monetary policy, all of these prices go down magically. Again, this is the lesson. Inflation is going to die at some point. We're going to move on. But never forget this lesson. You should have never forgotten it to begin with. Inflation is not a supply problem. Inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. And with that, folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. And we start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 326.63 points or a decline of around 1%. The Nasdaq down big, losing 373.44 points or a decline of 3.18%. The S&P 500 down by 65.87 points or a decline of 1.65%. The sector's performances led by energy at number one, capturing the gold medal. At number two for the silver, utilities. Number three for the bronze, materials. On the other hand, the laggards of the day led by consumer cyclicals, technology, and healthcare. So we're now back to the inflationary theme of energy and materials. 
this is becoming extremely confusing for market participants because you see days where they dump energy, they dump the defensives and the inflationary names, and they go with technology and cyclicals. And we see these attempts of a rebound rally in these names, technology, cyclicals, etc. But they're always met with failure. And as a result, market participants go back to what's been working year to date, in this case, energy, utilities, materials, defensives. So again, I continue to say stick with the winners, at least for now, until things change. For now, things are not changing. So we're sticking with energy, fertilizers, the consumer staples, because they've been working, that's all we have for now. The advance to decline ratios, NYSE 27% advancing versus 70% declining. The NASDAQ 18% advancing versus 78% declining. Commodities, look at this. Peak inflation, you said? Well, it's not here. Crude oil futures went higher. WTI gained almost 6% today alone. Brent gained almost 5%. Massive, massive gains for crude. Likewise, gasoline prices gained almost 4% today alone. This is what you're going to pay by the way at the pump so again inflation is surging out of control the fed is way behind the curve so we will see inflation surging higher again and therefore in this channel we're sticking with commodities energy stocks fertilizers materials the consumer staples the defensives because things are not changing in the inflation front if anything the market is saying we don't care about the cpi that we got today we don't care about what the fed is saying the fed is not even close so we're going to continue to buy the dips in energy gas commodities and this is exactly what we're seeing here heating oil futures gained around half a percentage point today and natural gas continues to move higher by the tune of almost three and a half percent today alone of course we have news that the ukrainians are now stopping the flow of gas from russia because the pipelines go through ukraine and ukraine is shutting the pipelines now of course our propaganda media says that the disruptions are happening from pro kremlin troops whatever that means but we know the ukrainians came out and said we're shutting the gas supplies the ukrainians are now punishing europe saying hey we're cutting the gas supply entirely you guys don't want to do it you're afraid that your economies are going to go down well we're going to do it for you we're going to drag you in into this war with russia physically and economically so what do you think is going to happen to natural gas prices in Europe? Well, they're surging higher, no doubt about it. But what is the substitute for now? US LNG. So natural gas prices in this country will continue to move higher and higher and higher. And we're sticking with natural gas stocks for this particular reason. What about softs? We have a down day for lumber losing around two and a quarter percent and then we have a down day for oj but oj has been running higher significantly for a while now although today lost around one percent and then we have sugar pretty much in the flat line while we have gains big one massive gains for coffee futures scoring over seven and a half percent today alone cotton moving higher cocoa moving higher and here it is metals it was a good day for metals all in all with exception of palladium palladium went down by all oh, bad one and a half percent the dollar did not move higher today interesting the dollar was flat and flat is good enough for metals to move higher can you imagine what would happen to metals if the dollar cools down for real we will see gold moving higher silver platinum copper all moving higher and i am liking copper here by the way i'm buying the dip in copper i think copper is going to move higher from this point on despite the lockdowns in china and all of that and of course instead of buying copper futures i already own fcx freeport mcmoran and i'm adding to my position via calls this is how i'm buying the dip in copper but regardless gold gained a little over half a percentage point so did silver and platinum the winner of the day gaining almost four percent today meets down day for both lean hogs and feeder cattle futures losing around one percent apiece yet we have live cattle futures gaining almost one percent when it comes to grains here it is we have gains big ones for soybean oil scoring three percent gains today alone likewise wheat scoring around two percent corn moved higher along with soybeans and oats rough rice with modest gains at around half a percentage point yet it was a down day for both soybean meal and canola futures losing some ground by about one percent apiece Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? Look at the volume. Dead. No movement at all. They're not buying calls and therefore we're not finding a bottom. Once we see participation in buying calls, we can say we have a bottom in the stock market for now. 
it's a free fall. The gravity is to the downside and the reason is nobody's buying calls. If anything, they're buying more puts now, betting for more downside. Regardless of that, Apple came at number one, the hottest table in the casino today, with around one and a half million contracts traded today. 53.5% of those were calls. And at number two, Tesla, at around 600,000 contracts traded for the name today, around 46% of those were calls. And at number three, NVIDIA, at around 450,000 contracts exchanging hands today, or about 60% of those were calls. But all in all, the volume is down. It's not even close to last year. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We have a call option spread for Apple. If you're going to play a rebound, you might want to follow this one because the risk versus reward is worth it. Now, Apple went down big today, over 5%. We're seeing liquidation. And of course, I shared the story of my clients who dumped over $16 million worth of Apple stock last week. And today they called me ecstatic. They're so happy. We got it right. We dumped Apple and look at that. It's down 5% today. But if you happen to be in the camp who thinks perhaps Apple went down too much in a short amount of time, and perhaps we have a rebound coming, maybe short covering profit taking by the end of the week, this is a good trade to be in because they bought the 155 calls for the expiration date, May 20th, and they sold the 160 calls for the same expiration date. And the goal from the trade here is, by the expiration date of Friday next week, if Apple moves higher by more than 6%, but now more than 9% by then, this trade will be profitable. I mean, it doesn't matter if Apple moves more than 9% because your profits are capped over there. But you're hoping that Apple moves by more than 6% by the end of next week. They paid around one buck a piece for buying the 155 calls. They received around 40 cents in credit from selling the 160 calls all in all the entry cost is reduced to around 60 cents a piece which uh, brings the total all the way to 1.2 million dollars and again the risking 60 cents to make five bucks in my book the risk versus reward is worth it if you happen to believe that Apple is going to rebound. What about the ticker OXY, Occidental Petroleum, one of the top performers year to date, but it was down big on Monday. And of course, you want to buy the dip in these names, energy, fertilizers, materials, because these are the names that are going to rebound higher again. But we saw folks scooping the dip right away. Here's somebody playing the dip via buying calls, and they're buying the 67 and a half calls for the expiration date, June 17, with expectations that the name could move higher by more than 12% by then. They paid around two bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around five and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker twtr twitter they're buying puts this time around interesting even though we have the deal with musk and the buying price is above 50 so you got it in the bag if the musk deal goes on you got it in the bag that the stock is going to close at 50 plus but here we have somebody betting that the stock is going to go down to 40 so what's going on here is this a bet that we will see the twitter deal falling apart who knows but they're buying the 40 bucks puts for the expiration date june 17th with the expectations that the name could move down by more than 13 percent by then they paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1.2 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker dal delta airlines they're buying calls interesting they're buying the 42 calls for the expiration date june 17th with the expectations that the name could move higher by more than 11 percent by then they paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars continuing with interesting trades what about the ticker se for c limited today we saw a rebound in roblox electronic arts also gained ground even though they lost the licensing deal with fifa and some Somebody's bidding that we could see more M&A activities in the video game arena. And in this case, they're actually bidding against C-Limited. Perhaps we will see an acquisition by this company and therefore the stock goes down. So they bought the 50 bucks puts for the expiration date, June 17th, with expectations that the name could go down by more than 12.5% by then. They paid around five bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around five and a half million dollars and then we have a call spread for amd and again the risk versus reward is pretty decent here but i do like the apple trade a lot more anyhow they're buying the 100 calls and they're selling the 105 calls all for the expiration date june 17th and the expectations here is for amd 
to move higher by more than 14% by then, but preferably not more than 19.5% by then. It doesn't matter if it does because the profits are capped. The most important condition here is for AMD to move by more than 14% by the expiration date of June 17th. In this case, they paid around 3 bucks a piece for buying the 100 calls and they received around 2 bucks a piece from selling the 105 calls. By doing so, reducing the entry cost to 1 buck a piece, all in all spending around $900,000. And lastly, what about the ticker TSLA the souffle Tesla the buying puts this I mean Tesla's falling apart at this point you know that right so all of these Tesla culties or Tesla's of the future bro are never gonna go down watch out for the bears because they're piling in and they're gonna rip your face apart in this case, they're buying the 600 puts for the expiration date, May 20th, with expectations that Tesla could fall apart by more than 18% by then. They paid around 6 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $3.5 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, look at this, a bloodbath. There was some optimism yesterday of rotating from REITs and utilities and defensives all the way back to the big caps, technology, software, etc. Not happening, not happening at all with seeing big caps down big apple microsoft facebook amazon tesla chips are down big software down big cyclicals are down big any attempt in reviving these names that lasts for a day or two and then we see them moving down again and therefore i say if you're looking for shorts meaning when a short from now till the end of the year for example do you short the software names some already down 70 percent from the top you're too late but you got the cyclicals the so-called reopening names casinos hotels cruises all of these are still elevated due to the reopening optimism they're gonna fall apart along with the big caps and the tech names today obviously the theme is risk off not risk on and the evidence is the underperformance of biotech versus the big pharma old school names yes they were down but not by a lot they were muted a matter of fact certain names actually closed in the green like Merck and Eli Lilly but the action right now in this stock market is very very limited it is limited to energy that's going to come down at some point we don't know when but we're going to continue to be with energy until the party's over likewise we're seeing fertilizers bouncing back in materials we're seeing utilities the ultra defensives in utilities and REITs also bouncing be it not with conviction we're also seeing the defensives bouncing a little bit but again no conviction here yet we're seeing tobacco for example philip morris one of the top performers today and at some point folks this stock market will be reduced to what to alcohol tobacco what else mcdonald's these happen to be some of the names that tend to outperform under a recessionary environment in the stock market, along with some big pharma, of course, some of these staples. But the options are getting limited here, folks. At some point, we're going to have to abandon the long portfolio entirely and just move to shorts, shorts and cash, until the bleeding stops. And of course, we're talking about energy stocks. Watch out here, because you got your boy, Jimmy Kramer, and Jimbo says that he's buying more oil. He likes oil now. So watch out, Jim Kramer might jinx the ratty in oil because this is the same guy by the way who said two years ago that oil is dead and there is no money to be made he said that oil and gas are uninvestable and his reasoning was pollution and the environment and yada 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 we also got news for starbucks apparently um actor james cromwell who appears in succession the tv show and he's actually good he's not a bad actor at all but he's uh, protesting starbucks he's protesting the upcharges for vegan milk and he did it by gluing his hand to the table so starbucks is under a lot of pressure from the unions from the international market slowing down and now we have folks protesting the upcharges for vegan milk and i say what do you want starbucks to do just hand out coffee for free look at the prices of oat milk almond milk soy milk all moving significantly higher what do you want the company to do lose money not gonna happen i mean the coffee sucks to begin with tastes like ass and it's overpriced but it is convenient i got a starbucks by my house you don't like it go somewhere else or better yet make your coffee at home but again these are the kind of pressures that companies are going through they're accused of price gouging some are doing a lot of price gouging but in this case i mean it is obvious differences of prices between whole milk and between almond milk soy milk oat milk all of these prices are jumping significantly higher it's going to be reflected in the prices you're going to pay at the grocery store 
and at Starbucks if you choose to drink vegan milk. Anyways, we're moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. Bloodbath across the board, not evident in international markets. That's interesting. We'll see if we're going to have a follow-up. For example, if we see a bloodbath in Asian and European equities overnight, we got a confirmation that what happened in the U.S. markets is contagious. But the interesting theme is the comeback of commodities, and this is evident by the EWZ as an outperformer today, the Brazilian commodities giant ETF. Commodities, be it gold, be it oil, be it UNG gas, be it silver, all moved significantly higher. Yet we have massive down days for uranium and solar, and obviously values outperforming growth. It appeared yesterday that growth was planning for a rebound after the CPI didn't happen. And now we're seeing both of them down, but value continues to outperform growth. Another interesting theme is the fact that the VIX proxies are actually either flat or down. The UVXY was down, the VXX was up slightly, but the VIX, the index itself, was down. The volatility index was down, even though we're seeing massive sell-offs in the S&P and in the NASDAQ. So what's going on here? The divergences will be fixed one way or the other. Either the VIX is going to pop significantly higher, or the VIX is saying that the sell-off in the equities market is overdone, and it's going to reverse soon. We'll see. But for now, you look at the ETFs, technology down across the board, be it chips, be it the old school XLK, financials down big. But look at healthcare. XLV, which has the old school big pharma names, big uh, insurance names, down slightly. But the XBI, the risk on biotech, is down big. We're talking 7% to the downside. Consumer cyclicals, XLY, XRT, down big. Not a good sign for the economy. And what's working is energy, XOP, XLE, barely. Utilities, the XLU, again, barely. That said, weakness across the board. Certainly not an exciting market to be a bull, but this is a lot of excitement for the bears continue to short and score. Let's move on here and do some charts before wrapping up and we start with the SPY 30 minutes chart. I'm going to be honest with you folks, there is nothing to look at here. The resistance was 405. It was a bull flag pattern waiting for the CPI to launch higher. The CPI came out disappointing for the equities market and therefore no buyers, nobody excited to buy the dip. So the equities market, in this case, the SPY took another leg down and there is no support close in sight. So there is nothing to look at here. It's a free fall. The stock market is in a free fall and we have to wait for the stock market to give us any sign for a reversal or a bottom. So for now, you got to stay short until we get any sign that this is over. And for now, we don't have any sign that it is over. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract of the SPY. The chart is losing 3,960. And the next support in my perspective is 3,850. The momentum indicators are weak. Yes, they're getting overextended to the downside, but who's to say that we're not going to see even more pain to come? The volume is moving higher on down days. All bad signs for the bulls, so the bears have to stick to their ground here until we see any sign of a reversal. And so far, the Fed meeting did not help. The rebound faded away right away. The CPI did not help, and any attempt for a rally faded away right away. So the bulls are running out of catalysts, and the bears have a clear ground now. Something gonna save the bulls. And in my opinion, it will be an emergency meeting by the Fed, indicating that they're gonna increase interest rates and do whatever it needs to be done to tackle inflation. Otherwise, when a market has no faith in the Fed at all, you're gonna see a free fall like we're seeing right now. Of course, again, for all of the dip buyers, you're not alone. But you gotta be careful here, because I tried to buy the dip uh, last week and the week before that, didn't happen. And I told my viewers, if the support of 4,102 is broken, you got to go short again. The shorts, the bears have to double down. And so far, so good. Let's see if the next support, 3,850, produces a rebound or not. But here's the bad news. When we look at the SPX, the daily chart for the cash index, remember the Wyckoff pattern that we talked about before? It has been spot on so far. And according to the Wyckoff pattern, if the support of the secondary test, which is 4,114.65 is broken, we go down 12%. On top of that, the very important psychological support of 4,000 is broken now. So if we go down 12% according to the Wyckoff pattern from the secondary test, we're going to be down at around 3,600. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it could happen because the Wyckoff folks have been accurate so far. So why would they be wrong now? Here's the 30 minutes chart for the Qs, the NASDAQ. Again, the last support of 297.5 is broken again. Any attempt for a pop after the CPI faded away because the buyers are nowhere to be found. Nobody's buying calls. Everybody's scared. Nobody's buying the dip here. Everybody's assuming that it's going to get a lot worse. We're going to see the unwinding of this bubble that has been 
in the making for over 20 years now, when you really think about it. And on top of that, we have fears of a recession. We have an incompetent federal government. We have an incompetent federal reserve. Why would you buy the dip? What will encourage you to buy the dip when you, don't, when you have no faith at all in the leadership? So again, you look at this chart, there's nothing to look at at all. There is no support. This is a free fall. So let's move on to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. And look at this. I'm zooming out now because I want to show you the next support that I have, which is around 11,058 and a half. We're not even close. The chart could flush down all the way down there. And we could see when that happens, oversold conditions that could merit a technical rebound. I don't know what's going to rescue the equities market now. The CPI didn't do it. The Fed didn't do it. It's hard to see. It's hard to see any catalyst, any tailwind to get us a rebound. So you got to stay short until you get a signal that this is over. Here's the Russell 2000, the IWM and hourly chart, and it's not looking good for the small caps. It lost the most important support, the last support of 188. So it's a free fall from this point on. And what if this is a formation of an ABC pattern? We got the A leg, we got the B, the rebound, and now we're about to form the C, and the C is going to get us down perhaps to 165. So you better watch out here. Here's the Dixie, the enemy of the stock market, the enemy of commodities, specifically precious metals right now. It did didn't cool down. It didn't blast higher, but it didn't cool down either. As if the dollar is saying, I don't buy it. The Fed will have to be even more aggressive to tackle this inflation because there is no peak inflation now. Until and unless we see a big flush down in the dollar, and that will happen by two things. Number one, inflation expectations moving down. And as a result, we see expectations for Fed tightening moving down. That could flush the dollar down. It is highly unlikely, though. Number two, if we see strength in a foreign currency, a major one, like the British pound, for example, the euro, the yen, but none of that is happening right now. The British pound is falling apart. The euro is falling apart. The Japanese yen is being devalued. So we're not seeing any solid headwind for the dollar to move down. And here's gold. The good news is we have a rebound from the Fibonacci support and we're keeping the trend line that is supposed to act as support. So, so far, so good. But we're not going to see gold spiking higher and producing another rally without the dollar and the 10-year yield cooling down. I'm not going to give you advice to sell, to buy. I'm just going to say, if you're sitting on gains, you got to assess here. Do you have conviction the dollar is going to cool down or the 10-year yield is going to cool down at some point? If that is your conviction, then gold is going to move higher and do your decisions accordingly. Buy the dip, add to your position, whatever you need to do. But if you believe that the dollar is going to continue to move higher along with interest rates, the 10-year yield, yes, the tailwinds are strong for gold, but it's going to struggle to move higher in the way you like it to be. So long as these two continue to move higher. So again, make your decisions accordingly. Here's the four hours chart for crude oil. It was a wild session, by the way. It was destined to go down 100, the last support, but then we saw conflicting information. Oil was down as the European equities were trading. But after the European close, we saw US equities falling apart and oil moving higher significantly, recapturing 105.84 support. What is the message here? I'm not going to jump into conclusions. I got to wait and see if we have a confirmation of this move or not. The confirmation would be a retest of 105.84 and then bouncing higher again. If that is the case, then crude will give it another shot at 114. If it passes that test, it goes to 118. But if it fails, a retest of the support of 105.84 84, it moves down to 100 once again. And here's natural gas, the Henry Hub, a daily chart. We talked about the center of gravity in the chart acting both as support and resistance. And guess what? The chart went down and retested the trend line and it produced a rebound. So, so far, so good for now. The assumption is natural gas should make higher highs to keep this pattern alive. The problem is, if you look at the RSI, the momentum indicator, it is a negative divergence. So the move to make higher highs will be extremely difficult for natural gas, technically speaking. But technicals is just one element that moves assets up or down. The fundamentals matter too, and we discussed the fundamentals now we have a shutdown of gas from Russia to European destinations. This will add more demand for liquid natural gas here from the US. And here's the 10 year yield, the daily chart. It's not going to make it above the steep trend line again. So we're seeing a cooling down of the 10 year yield. But market bulls are hoping 
and the cooling down in momentum for the 10 year yield should produce a massive flush down all the way to two and a half percent for example that would be good for the nasdaq and for the beaten down technology names the rkk types to rebound higher but we're not seeing this for now we're seeing that yes the momentum indicators are cooling down but they're cooling down via consolidation in a mini pullback the 10 year yield is maintaining three percent for now until and unless we see a flush down in the 10 year yield this is a sign of strength indicating that the 10 year yield wants to move higher not lower it is working out the overextension in the momentum indicators via consolidation and then once that's worked out it moves higher again not a good sign for the bulls or the bond bulls for that matter look at the tlt a weekly chart yes the tlt moved higher it is oversold we could see a short covering rally you better hope it gets us all the way to 125.12 closing the gap but again that would only happen if the 10-year yield flushes down so all of these pops you gotta take them with a grain of salt in the tlt here's the vix and the mystery of the vix by the way four hours chart the q's down big the spy down big certain equities individual names down big but the vix is not responding market participants are not hedging anymore what's going on here the vix is maintaining 33 as resistance for now it maintains a lower high it maintains negative divergences on both the rsi and the macd all pointing out that the vix should go down if that is the case that is what we're seeing in the stock market right now a bear trap or we could see an explosive short covering rally or is the vix saying there is complacency here and the divergence the gap will be closed out when we see another panicky day in the stock market we see equities down big and we see the vix finally popping higher and catching up with the move in stocks as we see market participants hedging once again of course the hedging will be triggered if we have key support lines broken and we've already broken 4,000 in the spx we haven't closed below 4,000 for the week but maybe if that happens that triggers a lot of hedging for now it is an intriguing mystery because you think the vix should be popping higher with the nasdaq is down three percent when the big caps are melting but it's not the case one of these two is lying is it the SPY playing a possum or is it the VIX being shy for now? And it's going to pop higher again sooner or later. We'll see. But the case remains the same for the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ. It is not moving higher. The VIX is down 3%, VXN pretty much flat, holding at 40. It still has positive momentum, but why isn't it moving higher? Frankly, I don't have the answer, but we will find out the answer very soon. Either the NASDAQ is going to blast higher in a short covering rally, and the message from the VXN right now is, what you're seeing in the NASDAQ is a bear trap because folks are not hedging or it's going to be the opposite we're going to see another massive leg down in the nasdaq another massive leg higher in the vxn and what the vxn is saying right now what you're seeing is a complacency by market participants who are choosing not to hedge we'll see here's apple look at this ugly ugly action by apple the most important name in the stock market by the way the volume is moving higher on the down day the momentum indicators are falling apart apple lost the support of the lower edge of the trend line the channel it lost 150 as support and now it's looking at 145 as support here's the problem for apple we zoom out to a weekly chart we have a defined trend line right now and the chart is pretty much exactly at the trend line you break that trend line and the floodgates will open right away because when we use the Fibonacci levels if that trend line is broken we could see Apple moving down another nine percent before we have support according to the Fibonacci levels what about Tesla on hourly chart again it is losing all key supports it lost 825.25 it did not make it above 802.41 and the next support i have is around 700 on the hourly chart but when we zoom out to the weekly and we use the fibonacci supports the next support is not going to be found until let's say 640 which will be another downside of 13 percent plus from this point on moving on to tulips btc what's going on here the flush down continues it is getting oversold but look at this watch out Thirty thousand is lost to support if we don't have a rescue moment by the end of the week and a recapturing of three thirty thousand excuse me as support it's about to get really really ugly in the tulips market why when we zoom out to a weekly chart we have the bear flag playing out but we got important support at twenty eight thousand. so if thirty thousand is broken you got twenty eight thousand. if that's broken we use the fibonacci levels we're gonna go down another let's say 38 percent to what 18,000 20,000 that's going to be ugly and we will see a lot of margin calls if that happens if bitcoin crashes to 20,000 and below you're going to see margin calls across stocks tesla would go down nvidia would go down apple would go down big because 
they got to pay for all of these margin calls. And lastly, AMC, I'm going to stop covering AMC because it's going to go down to zero. I wish I had better news for the apes, but game over. If we use the Fibonacci levels in a weekly chart, from this point on, it could go down another 81% to the next support at around two, two and a half bucks. And if it goes down there, you're going to see margin calls again, but most importantly, you will see the bankruptcy of the company. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have initial jobless claims. We also have the PPI, producer price index. This is the final reading. And then we have another Fed zombie from San Francisco daily speaking. Who cares at this point? If you're not going to come out and say the 75 basis points on the table again, nobody's interesting to hear anything here. With that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow. When the money's coming your way, you don't ask any questions. <laughs>